G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. We'll have all the show notes and any resources mentioned in the cast on our website. Leaving a leading architectural firm to work for a large engineering company, Kylie saw how profitable a well-run professional services can be. She convinced her partner in Hobart and a best friend in Launceston to quit their architectural jobs and in late 2011 start Cumulus Studios, a national and internationally award-winning firm. Starting with four FTE and two of those founders working other jobs to pay the bills, they quickly grew to now 18, more than half those female. Adding an office in Melbourne and work around Southeast Asia and Australia, revenue exploded from $55,000 in FY12 to now $3 million. In 2020, Cumulus was named one of 10 small architectural architecture firms to watch from a leading New York architecture magazine. Funding growth has been from their initial savings and now profits. Kylie invests a lot in professional development and the culture. She believes the hardest thing in growing a small business is maintaining work-life balance, especially when working with your partner. Advice you'd give yourself on day one is don't try and work everything out on your own, get mentors. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing Kylie Scott from Cumulus Studios here in Hobart, Tasmania. Welcome Kylie. Thank you, Troy. Let's start with how we know each other. It's a, a mutual friend and I guess a client of Cumulus for some years, Greg Ramsey, Rambo, uh, on projects like Ratho Farm, Greg's golf course, the oldest golf course in Australia actually, in the Southern Hemisphere I think, uh, where Peter, your husband, was the architect to do up the old convict cottages uh, and also Willie Smith's Apple Shed, which was I think one of Cumulus Studios' first projects in Southern Tasmania. So obviously through Sam Reed and and Smithy. Um. Yeah, yeah, no, no, they were great projects, and um, and I think the first time you and I came across each other was at um, the launch of the Forty Spotted Gin. And yep. That's we, right. When I was at Lark Distillery, we spun off the gin into its own separate brand. That was a a, a big evening. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was great. <laughs> Another project that you guys have worked on uh, directly with me is the Wilderbask Experience Pods that we're trying to find land in Tasmania to place around the state. Um, Cumulus designed a really beautiful um, pod for us that we can throw out in the bush and, you know, it's all runs off solar and um, self-sustaining, etc. So we've been really impressed with um, the work that Cumulus did, you know, the professional attitude and response times and obviously the design is just spot on. So, well, let's tell the audience a bit about the business, um, you know, where it's located, what it does, how it makes money. Yeah. So as you said before, our business is called Cumulus. We are based across design studios in Hobart, Launceston and Melbourne. We are a team of architects, project coordinators and designers, and we work together to create unique buildings and master plans and spaces. We also undertake a lot of feasibility studies for clients. So yeah, we're a professional services company, so our clients pay us to design and deliver projects that have real personality and that are the perfect fit for the people they are designed for. All of the um, owners are born and bred Tasmanians and I think our Tassie origins have made us both resourceful in how we approach business and design and working within a budget. People talk a lot about making sure you specialise in one particular area, area or product, but for our company to operate in Tasmania, that really wouldn't work. I think our specialisation is not in one sector, but instead in creating and delivering quite unique projects whether it is a residence, a public building, social housing or a new hotel, our designs are really responsive to their context and the experience, the end users of the space. Um, so we have been a jack of, like we've really been jack of all trades right from the start. Yep. It means that at any one time we have a lot of different projects on and I think we've got about 45 live projects on at the moment um, and quite a few other ones on hold. We have a lot of um, private residential clients and we work on renovations, restorations and new houses. Mm -hmm. Currently, our restoration and extension to the Simmons Plains um, homestead is shortlisted on the Tasmanian Architecture Awards in wow. the Heritage category. And we're, yeah, that's a beautiful one. We're really excited to see how that goes. But, yeah, um, because Cumulus has got a bit of a reputation for work on heritage buildings, obviously with Ratho Farm, Greg's Golf Course and Combination up there. There's 18 cottages, you know, ex-convict cottages from the 19th century that had to be restored. So 
and they've yeah. come up beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a fantastic project, and we just we just think um, maintaining our cultural heritage is such an important thing for the state. Yep. It really gives everything you know, an immediate character and helps with the storytelling about um, about a place. And when you're dealing with the experience economy, it's, yeah, it's just really invaluable having yeah. cultural heritage. Yeah, when uh, I was working with Peter on the uh, Wilderbask Experience pods, I think I mentioned to him um, when I got to get my art, get my act together and get off my ass and buy some land, I'll be getting you guys certainly to be designing my home. Oh, we'd love that. Yeah. Be- Thanks, Troy. <laughs> yeah. Looking forward to it. Yeah, you've done some really iconic projects in Tasmania and clearly an award-winning um, um, business as well. You guys have won a lot of awards. Yeah, yeah, we have. Um, it's really um, really great to be recognised by your peers. What, what about um, some of the big projects people in Tasmania, even Australia, might be aware of that Cumulus have worked on? So um, our most well-known clients in the Tasmanian context would include commercial clients like Simon Current, who we worked on Pump House Point with. It's a beautiful hotel literally on Lake St. Clair, isn't it? Yeah, it's be- yeah, it is so yeah, it's right yeah. on the lake. It's beautiful. I haven't been there um, yet, but it's on the list. Yeah. I haven't actually stayed there either. Yeah. Um, and other clients include Stillwater. On um, we've worked on their recently completed Stillwater Seven. Yeah, Rod Asquio had him on the podcast early on, actually, when we were on King Island playing golf, ironically yeah. for Greg's first Bucks party this year. Yeah. <laughs> um, other clients in Tassie are Brown Brothers. We worked on the Devil's Corner project with them. That's um, a great. That's a great winery, isn't it, on the east coast overlooking. Uh, Oyster, is it Oyster Bay and the, that yeah, hazard? Pretty, yeah, pretty eye-catching and we yeah, we won a number of um, national awards for that one. Wow. Um, so also, as you mentioned before, we worked on the Willie Smith Apple Shed with um, Sam and Andrew Smith. Yep. Had Sam on the, the podcast also from Willie Smith's Organic Cider. Yeah, that, that was a great um, turnaround of that old shed was quite a derelict apple museum. Yeah, no, it's beautiful that project. We're really proud of that. It's one, of, as you said, it's one of our early projects, and it, you know, it still really stacks up. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, so, and as long alongside those sort of commercial um, clients, we've got lots of work with lots of government departments, parks and wildlife services, communities, the education department, other um, government organisations such as Tasports, um, NGOs, and community organisations such as the Harvest Market up in Launceston and Ferment Tasmania. Um, other in Victoria, we've got our office in Victoria has been busy working on um, some ho- a number of hospitalities and tourism projects. Yep. Clients like the NGV Tesla Tulip Farm, Brown Brothers again, and Bendigo, um, the gold mine there. Um, and then we've sort of branched off further afield. So we've got clients at the moment for uh, Doma. We're working on a multi-residential project in Canberra for them. Done a bit of consulting work for Mondelez Cabaret in New Zealand, the New Zealand Whiskey Company, um, and currently working on a big um, hotel project in Penang. Wow, in Penang. Jeez. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, so, yeah, we do projects that range in size and complexity um, from anything from, you know, $100,000 renovation to a um, $100 million project. Yep. Yeah. Wow, that's exciting. And you've, what's the big one up at Cradle Mountain you're currently working on? So we have um, the first stage is just finished of the Cradle Gateway Visitor Centre um, and then the next stage, the Dove Lake Viewing Shelter, um, is currently under construction. Yeah, great. Looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, we um, just before we went into physical isolation, we managed to take all our team up to um, to visit the Cradle Mountain um, Gateway Visitor Centre. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was fantastic to see it all complete and I'm looking forward to um, when it opens up again so everyone else can have a look. Yeah, I'm looking at taking my daughter up there in the July school holidays, actually. It's uh, great for families and day bushwalking. It's a beautiful spot, part of Tasmania. Yeah, we um, had a few um, photographs of the building covered in snow and it looks, yeah, it looks really good in snow as well as sunshine. Yeah, Yeah, great. Well, can you tell the audience a bit about how Cumulus started out? So I'm um, originally from Launceston and I had my son Jerry when I was quite young. I was 17 and then I, I 
studied two degrees at UTAS up there. I did environmental design and then um, a Bachelor of Architecture. So after graduating in 2001, I'm, Jerry and I moved down to Hobart to work at a company um, called Morris Dunn & Associates. And that's where I met my partner, Peter Walker. Mm-hmm. We were lucky to work on some really great projects there, like the Henry Jones Hotel in Islington, and we met some really great clients, oh, well, interesting characters, really. Yeah. And um, the, the, I think working for, for that company really sort of highlighted the benefits of um, weaving storytelling and our cultural heritage into architectural projects. Um, then I had a complete change of pace and I went to work for a huge professional services company called GHD. Mm-hmm. They were going through a really rapid growth period at the time, employing lots of young professionals and acquiring lots of smaller specialised engineering firms. So um, I had some really great um, bosses there, David Kinnenborough and Lucas McVeigh and Eric Richardson. So yep. I from them. Um, it was really for that, for me, that was really eye-opening to see the profit sort of focus way engineers approached running a professional services company. Yeah how lots of architectural firms did it um and that really sparked my system like my interest in systems and i could see how much time systems can save you if you get the right ones in place absolutely so yeah and um lots of actually it was a really good training ground i think a lot of the young professionals that i started with at ghd have all gone on to run their own firms (laughs) yep um since leaving there um I also spent a, spent four years working in the cultural heritage and planning area at the Hobart City Council, yep. which was um, great. There's a really great community spirit there and it was good to see how the planning system worked and how um, diff- different disciplines can really work together. Um, if there's no project fees involved, everyone has a great <laughs> sense of camaraderie. Yeah. Um, and uh, another reason I started our own or we started our own business, I think, was um, growing up in Launceston, our, my family's business, Jackson Security, was a really big part of my life. Um, that, that started back in 1883 and it's still going. Wow. So it's been through two world wars and the Depression and um, my grandfather, he was heavily involved in the business up until when he died a couple of years ago in his 90s and... Um, I just think I always felt that running my own business, I kind of had it in my genes. Yep, yep, <laughs> me too. My father was a fuel distributor for BP when he retired, I think late 50, in his late 50s, he was selling about 100 million litres a year. So one of the four main distributors in Victoria. And I think that you know, it's been in my blood because he's pretty much run his own petrol businesses since I was a boy. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and then, yeah, so in late 2000. And- 11, I think I was about 30, um, 35, and our daughter, who just turned three, um, Pete was a partner at a local architectural firm and he was struggling to negotiate a further buy in to that company. Was that, that, he was still with Morris Nunn? Yeah, it was called, um, they changed their name at that stage to Circa Morris Nunn Walker. Got it. And, and was, um, sorry, was the, so Peter was there still because Sapphire is about 10 years old now. So Pete worked on yeah, Sapphire? Was yeah, that, that was. Sapphire was his baby um, working with Federal um, and that's how we met Simon Current through through Sapphire as well. Yeah, for those that don't know, Sapphire is a beautiful five-star, even six-star hotel on the East Coast, again, near Wineglass Bay, near Devil's Corner. We spoke about before. Uh, I think there's 20 suites or 22 suites, minimum $1,800 a night to stay, all inclusive, alcohol and food, but a beautiful shaped, it's like a manta ray, isn't it, the building, the main building? <laughs> Yeah, it is a bit, but it wasn't supposed to be. <laughs> um, yeah, that was just like in hindsight, yes, it does look like a manta ray. Um, yes, but um, yeah, no, it's fantastic. Fantas- we're really proud of that project still. I worked on that a little bit with him as well. But yep. um, yeah, so he just he just finished that and he was just trying to work out whether or not he really did want to buy into that company further. Um, and at the same time, my best friend um, from uni, Todd Henderson, was feeling unhappy working in his role for an architect in, in Launceston. Yep. Um, and one thing I love doing is connecting ideas and people. And so I suggested that they should team up together. Great. They're yeah. Different characters, but they're both excellent architects. And um, so they started, yeah, we started working from each end of the state. Yep. Um, yeah. That's how we began. Great. That's fantastic. I'm just going to, I'll just get Peter to throw it. 
something back on the Sapphire. That um, yeah, Sapphire's won, I think, the best boutique hotel in Australia three years now and won, I think, an international award like that as well. So it's a very uber high-end um, accommodation offering. Yeah, not stayed there yet, but again, that's on the list too. Yeah, no, I hope you do. hope you get there soon. Um, yeah. I, um, yeah, so that, that experience with um, Sapphire really kind of put us on the front foot um, to, yeah, to undertake projects like to Pump launch. Point yeah. And you know, Pete loves working on those sorts of big commercial. Yeah, great. So, well, that's great. So the, the starting up was really it was your idea, and you put um, Todd and Peter together and the t- started to build the team. Yeah. So um, so originally we had four business partners. We had um, Todd and Todd Henderson and Jen Hegarty, who are based in Launceston, and Peter and me, um, and then in we opened our studio in Melbourne in 2014. And so our Melbourne director, Keith Westbrook, and his his wife, Alicia Bennett, are also shareholders with us. Yep. Great. And so when you started out, uh, maybe to give some context of growth, uh, how many staff, what FTE did you have when you started out? Yeah, so after six months of operating, we found a graduate um, architect to assist Todd in Launceston. And he worked as a contractor for about six months until we felt confident to change that into a permanent position. And then we put on another staff member in Hobart. So a year later, two had become six, then 12. And now we've increased it to a team of 24. Great. Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well done, Kylie. So, and I guess I didn't explain just then um, that our team of 20 plus four working working directors um, equates to 18 full-time equivalents. We have right. lots of part-time people. Yep. Great. Well, I'll move on to, unless you've got anything else to illustrate the growth, any other key numbers? Um, yeah, I have got a few. Yep. I can go, go through. Um, and I might even just re, uh, I might reframe some of that team member stuff too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so, um, okay, so in as far as sales go, like when we first started, um, I think we started late November 2011. So in the first six months that fin- that that financial year, we we'd invoiced out about 55 grand in sales, um, and then the next full financial year we invoiced out 300 thousand, and then the next year it doubled, and then doubled again, plateaued a bit, yep. and then, um, doubled again. So it's been kind of jumps uh, jumping up um and all that doubling sound pretty sounds more exciting than it is um i think we'll be sitting i think we'll be sitting at about the three million dollar mark in sales wow that's fantastic. Kind of, yeah. yeah yeah that's fantastic that's amazing growth yeah so um and that being said <laughs> our turnover is definitely impacted by covid19 so yeah. um i'm um, yeah god knows what's going to happen next year <laughs> we can just but um, maybe it's good that you've got me on now and not in a year's time. But hopefully I'll, I can come on again another time and tell you how yep. how have navigated the whole system. Yeah, well, hopefully with the, grant, the government throwing a lot of money at infrastructure projects, you guys might be able to pick up some more work there. Yeah, yeah, I really hope so. Yeah, great. Um, we'll move on to the next question then, if, unless anything else on key numbers. So this one... This one's one of my favourites and also one of the toughest ones to answer. When was the moment you felt like you had succeeded? Yeah. Um, well, this is actually kind of easy for me, I think. Um, I think I'm really lucky in that I get to experience the feeling that we have succeeded every time I get to visit one of our completed projects. Yeah. Um, there's so much hidden hard work that goes into the finished product from our team, the clients, other consultants, and, of course, the builders. And I just, yeah, I really love seeing the um, final result we um as i mentioned before we were lucky enough to fit in an old staff trip um up to northern tasmania just before the state went into lockdown so we got to visit some of our recently completed projects like the stillwater seven hotel hotel verge and the cradle mountain visitor center and yeah it's always just so exciting for me to see what our team have produced it's great yeah great and does that, I guess, answer the next question? What does success look like to you? It's you know completion of a, a great project. Yeah, it is. Um, and also, as we mentioned before, um, as professionals, it's it's really great to be recognised by our by our peers, mm-hmm. and especially on the world stage. Um, the international recognition we received for Pump House Point and Devil's Corner was really exciting and really boosted our confidence going forward. 
um, and with how online media works, our, our projects are published all around the world um, from Korea, China, Spain, Brazil, etc. But um, recently we've had a bit of publicity in the local press where we were named as one of the 10 small architectural firms, architectural firms to watch in 2020 wow. by the New York-based um, company Architizer. Wow. That was, that was such a good, that was a nice good news story during yep. the COVID situation. And, um, but I was reflecting because I think for me on a personal level, success um, looks like uh, being able to provide a sustainable, sustainable, fulfilling employment opportunities for our yeah. staff and having a real collaborative team culture where everyone's respectful, it's harmonious and it feels really equitable. Yep. Yep. But I also... I also love having things running smoothly so that I'm able to do school pickups, spend time with our daughter, spend time gardening and everything. So all those things contribute to me feeling moments of success. Yeah, that's great. That's one of the things I love about what I do is the, the flexibility of time shift. So I've, I've got Maggie, my daughter, every second week. So I work pretty much five hour days those weeks because I do drop off and pick up at quarter to three with her and we hang out and she beats me at chess most times now these days being a seven-year-old. And then obviously the next week I just work longer hours and often on a Saturday to make kind of make all the time work. But having that flexibility has been, you know, is actually one of the reasons I said in the last cast was why I went into business was to be able to have the flexibility and grow up with my kids. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really important. <clears throat> what about funding the business growth? So have you taken on any investment over the years or government grants or bank finance, anything like that? No, no. It took um the way we funded it in the early days was just um, Todd not and paying, people not working. <laughs> no, well, we were, Todd, and, Todd and Pete were working from home and Jen Hegarty and I were both out working other jobs <laughs> outside yeah. of the company and so supporting our families and um, and we had to dip into our personal savings. But yeah. um, since then we... Um, since then, we've just survived on cash flow. In the early days, every now and then, I looked at getting an overdraft, particularly in that um, January, February, really tight period of time for us. Yeah. Um, it was, there was such, there seemed like such an overkill amount to get and it was just the process to go through to get them. Application process was a pain in the ass. So I, we just powered through and we've just gotten much better at budgeting for those quieter times now. Yeah. All right. What about government grants apart from the COVID stuff? Anything before that? No. no. Yeah, right. Okay. If you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? I sure would. Um, I love um, the architectural industry and I love running the business side of things and we'll definitely do it all over again. But if we were super cashed up when we started, I think we would have taken on more of our own development yep. projects. We, um, the strategic thinking and design work we um we put into things, add so much value to other people's projects and it would have been, it would be really great to have capitalised on that for ourselves a bit more. Um, plus I think um, the freedom of being our own client would be fun. Yes, absolutely. Might be very stressful as well. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Um, I remember in the early days we, when we just had two staff and it must have been straight after we'd paid a, a bass payment or something so our accounts were really low and we were waiting on a couple of outstanding invoices to be paid so we could make the pay run and it just felt so stressful um it was one thing not to pay ourselves if we were low on cash for a couple of days but i never wanted to be in a situation where we couldn't pay our staff yeah um anyway it, turned, it was fine we um turns out if you look at your bank account obsessively every five minutes <laughs> sometimes money does just appear um, and so everyone was paid on time but um from then on we've kept a really large buffer in our accounts right yeah um and then the 2017-18 financial year was a really big year for us we had a heap of new staff start our workload was really intense and then to top things off um <laughs> A couple of our um, employees were busted by their respective partners having an affair. Oh, no, so, together? Yes. Together. Oh, no. During work time too. Um, anyway, um, our, so our office, our Hobart office really suffered. It's, it was just too small a place to have that sort of drama. It was yeah. really fun. And um, the fallout really affected the morale of the office and Sadly, we lost one of our key team, team members because they couldn't bear to work in the same place as the 
person that I had an affair with. Yep. Complete mess. Um, and had a really close knit team. And I, I really, it was stupid. I let the drama of the situation and the anger of the impact it was having on our um, business really get to me. Yeah. To the point of, um, after a very heated discussion about how we should deal with the situation with Pete one evening, um, I actually suddenly lost eyesight in one of my eyes, in my left eye. Wow. Weird. Sorry about this being a bit of a grim story, Troy. Right. But um, right. anyway, that, that led to a diagnosis of MS. And um, so that was a real wake-up call. Um, my eyesight is okay now. and But I've really, from that, I've really learned to keep my stress levels under control. Yeah. That keeps my MS under control. Yeah. So... I think the moral from that story is, first of all, sometimes the office culture can be a bit too friendly. Yep. Um, also, if you're going to have an affair, pick someone from a different workplace. <laughs> and our, you know, and and our mental health and physical health is completely intertwined. So you have to look after yourself. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, 20 years now, I've been in running small business and have had some very stressful moments. That payroll chestnut that you mentioned before, certainly been through that many times, the early days of starting up. And um, the, yeah, the mental health, I've seen a lot of people, I've seen a couple of business partners actually have a nervous breakdown, um, uh, you know, staff members, suicide, uh, deaths, births, murders, you know, I've seen a lot and it really can affect uh, and yeah, the, the whole, the stuff I've seen, I should probably write a book one day, but being through it, yeah, mental health is, is becoming more, uh, aware or recognized, I guess, in, in the workplace these days, which is good to see, but there's still a lot, a lot to go. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Absolutely. What area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most at the greatest value? So that would be our systems. Yep. Um, just so important. Um, particularly with my MS diagnosis, it made me really focus on making sure that someone else can do my job just in case something crazy happens again. Um, I really, I like listening to the, to a book called Clockwork right. um, by Mike McHallowitz. Mm-hmm. I had to listen, like I listened to it as an audio book and you have to sort of listen to it double time because he makes heaps of cheesy jokes. So you have to <laughs> right. through those ones. But um, he really emphasises how um, the importance of getting your systems in place, um, assembling a strong team and making sure you delegate yep. um, so that your time, you know, on the working, you know, on the business is being put to the best use. I haven't so, read that one, uh, but I'll put, definitely put it on my list. Is it similar to The E-Myth by Michael Gerber? It, it is similar. Yeah, it is similar. But, I mean, for me, the E-Myth didn't, um, it was interesting. When I, when I read the E-Myth, it didn't do much for me because I, like, I actually didn't want to be on the tools. I actually wanted to work on the business. So it was yep. quite interesting. I can talk about that in a second. Too. Yep, sure. Yeah. yeah. So and we're, we're continue, continually looking um, at how to improve our systems. Um, so it feels like a never-ending task, but um, we've been using lots of cloud-based systems in, um, for a long time, like, um, of course, Zero, Monday, Slack, the Google Suite, and that's really made a difference to our productivity and connectivity across the offices. And it's also really helped to put us in good stead for this current situation where we've all been working yeah, more right. currently than normal. Yeah, what's Monday, Monday.com like? Um, I've been uh, meaning to look at it. Yeah, we we tried out a few different systems and we like yeah we like Monday. Yep. There was a um, podcast on free economics called "Here's Why Your All Your Projects Are Late and What to Do About It." Yep, it's about the optimism bias you have when you're trying to estimate how long things are going to take you to do, and some of the key tips from that are using programs like Monday for task management. We also run all our um, QA systems on there as well. It's um, just really user friendly. Um, and that's what we're trying to aim for. We don't want to just have systems just for the hell of it. We want to yeah. make them do our job better. Great. I'm going to I'm going to look into that because certainly for my for the offshore team, I've got a few staff in the Philippines that do all zero book work for some companies. And obviously, Peter, the our editor is in uh, podcast editor is in Kenya, so we're getting big enough now to help me to stop using spreadsheets in Google and to manage their workload. So Monday's been top of my list to check out. So I'll check that out. And the podcast on Freakonomics sounds really good. Yeah, great. What have you enjoyed the least about managing the fast growth? So I've really disliked the feeling of always chasing 
my tail yep. <laughs> and being slightly out of control when we've had those real fast growth periods. Um, if you're stram- if you if you are behind the eight ball, scrambling to get the systems in place, it's really hard to get perspective and make good decisions, especially on employment. Yep. Um, they the periods of fast growth are really exciting at the same time, but I much prefer the calm efficiency <laughs> yep. of um, the periods of time where we're in more of a steady as she goes um, mode. I think the other really difficult thing for us um, has been finding affordable, flexible office space. Mm-hmm. In the nine years we've been operating, we moved the Launceston office from Todd and Jen's dining room table to three different office locations. Oh, painful. But in Hobart, we've moved five times. (laughs) All right. (laughs) And um, in Hobart in particular, the studio spaces available were really limited and really expensive. So when you... And when you're growing, it's really hard to know how much space you're going to need in 12 months' time. So it makes it really difficult to commit to long-term leases. Yep. Um, and, of course, each new move takes heaps of time and money and distracting. it's distracting for the staff. But without moving, we really couldn't have expanded um, to take on some of the larger projects we've worked on. Uh, and this period of time working from home, it's going to be really interesting when our office leases are coming up for um, renewal next year um it's gonna be really interesting to see what sort of spaces we choose to move to yep because we probably realized we don't need as much space as we thought we did so more flexible working from home for sure yeah Yeah. i think that is a big structural shift coming in the workplace Uh, a lot more businesses now will be more open to trusting their staff to work from home uh, which i've been doing for five six years since i left lark Uh, And before that, when I was still at at New Zealand Whiskey, I've really enjoyed it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Lots of our staff have responded really well working from home. I mean, they still get to go to project sites. And we um, now that the lockdown has eased a little bit, um, we're going to get together in the flesh to have more project um, team meetings, cafes. But um, no one's in a mad rush to get back to the office. Yeah, great. Especially with all the cleaning yeah, <laughs> protocols that we have to do. I think I've been where I, last night when I went out to, to, to Hobart Brewing Company. It was the first time, obviously, pubs could open in Hobart. I think last night was the only the third time in two months I've worn jeans. Pretty much been in active wear the entire time. And did your jeans do up still? <laughs> well, that's the other thing with this lockdown. I've been air quotes supporting my local cafe by not just getting my coffee every day, but getting a jam donut at one <laughs> cafe, and then I'll interlace it the next day. Go to the other cafe, which has got beautiful chorizo tarts. <laughs> so yeah, I've put on a bit of weight. I haven't dared jump on the scales yet, but I've got to do something about that. <laughs> oh, don't worry until spring. You'll be right. It's yeah. <laughs> what has been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? I think um, the biggest mindset shift for me has happened quite recently we've been going through a branding process with a design and strategy agency called for the people we have tried (laughs) to do a rebrand we're not we're not going to change our name or anything but um we've tried to update our branding a number of times previously but each time we failed because we kept on trying to force ourselves into a singular identity yep the Cumulus founders all bring their unique perspectives on the role of architecture, as does the rest of the team. So what we're finding with the current branding process, um, it's really given us the freedom to embrace our differences and to recognise that this is actually a benefit to each project and it helps make each project unique with the different people working on it. Yep. On the different sites and everything. Um, so really, I'm pretty excited about that and that will be rolled out in the coming months. We haven't... Yep got there yet but really excited about that so one of the things i've learned that sometimes we haven't made the tough decisions on staff if they're not performing properly we haven't made that early enough and yeah trying to deal with issues early on because they just get worse and um there's no point in avoiding anything yeah that's it's always been a tough one and i've certainly changed the way i think about managing people obviously over the 20 years and that, that whole thing of an underperformer, if you haven't done your job as a manager and given them feedback, coach them, develop them, and at the same time, so give them the opportunity to change, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's a really painful thing. As I say, I think people are the hardest thing in small business and it's where the value's at because you can't do it on your own. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. All right, what's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? 
So the number one habit for me is um, to keep a really good eye on the cash flow and forecasting. Yeah. And while you might have other people taking on more responsibility for the invoicing or bookkeeping side of things, you really don't want to lose touch of what's going on. We we were, have been pretty good at managing our cash flow, but as we became bigger, I was finding it was harder to keep a good handle on what was coming up, what was um on what was going on with our upcoming liabilities. Yep. We used to have just two bank accounts set up, like a transaction account and a savings account. Yep. And the savings account would be nice and full and it was really difficult to tell, is that money sitting there for the next best payment? Is it, can it be used for training? Can we take some profit? Yep. It was just difficult. So last year we um, switched to um, the Profit First system. Um, that's also by Mike McCullowicks. There's right. a bit of a theme going on here. I must be a, a Mike McCullowicks fan. Um, <laughs> so we have, I've never heard of that. So maybe explain that to me. So, yeah, it, I guess it operates a bit like the old envelope um, budgeting method. Yeah. So we now have six bank accounts mm-hmm. um, and our yearly budget sets out how much percentage of our income is allocated to each different account. Got it. So we have tax, payroll, operating expenses, profit and long-term savings. Um, I think the most useful thing for us is that the directors can look at the bank accounts to get a quick snapshot of what's going on instead of having to sift through a big report. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. And um, and he, he also promotes reversing um, the sales less expenses equals profit equation instead of and instead puts the profit savings aside first. So it's sales less profit equals your expenses. Got it. So um, that reframing and really forced us to, has really forced us to think differently about our spending habits so that we're more frugal. And I think this system has been set up, has been really helpful um, in us navigating the current COVID. Yep. Yeah, great. That's wonderful. Um, I'm certainly going to be reading that uh, his book and any other material he's published. That sounds, yeah, really good. Jump over to growersmallbusiness.com and leave your details to get a short two-minute email I send on Fridays to help small business owners like you become better leaders. I include some reading or professional development resources I've discovered in the last week. Can you talk to how you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes and advice for those listening? You've already touched on it a little bit. It sounded like a real um, clusterfuck with that affair um, happening in the office, in the team. Yeah. Yep, that would be exactly how Todd would describe it too. <laughs> um, so after about six months of operating, we found a graduate architect to assist Todd in Launceston. He worked as a contractor for about six months until we felt confident to change that into a permanent position and we also put a second staff member on in Hobart. A year later, two became six and then 12 and we've increased to the team of 24 that we have today. So 20 staff plus four working directors. Yep. Um, We've got a really great team right now, but we've made, yeah, of course, made a few mistakes along the way. Um, Simple, if any of our team makes simple errors, these can have a really significant financial impact to our clients and to our business. Of course. So we expect a very high standard of our team, yeah. not only in terms of their creativity, but also in their professionalism and attention, attention to detail. detail. Yeah, so important. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've extended our probationary period from, it was originally three months, but we now have that period to six months. Great. Good call. Takes- it takes at least that long to see if a person, you know, see what the person's capabilities are like and, yeah. and within the office. Um, and finding the right people for us is it's really tricky, especially in Tasmania. Yes. Population of half a million people. Yeah. <laughs> in a specialised area. Yeah. We have um, periods of time where we're getting so many amazing designers sending through their portfolios to us, but we just haven't got the project the workload on to support them but then other times we've you know had specialist recruitment agencies searching Australia for the right candidate for us and we haven't had any luck at all it's so it's so finicky yeah um we last advertised for a new team member earlier this year and this time I got Dr Simon Fishwick who used to work at the university um in to assist us to undertake a more strategic selection process great 
I had talked to Simon at a couple of employer of choice events and I really liked his approach in thinking about the cultural fit and the long-term characteristics of the applicant that we need. Definitely. Mm. So, yeah, we actually ended up with two new staff out of the process yep. and they, they, I think they had a both, they both had a week in the office before we went down into, like we went into physical isolation. No. So really not great timing, but they have been excellent additions and we're really lucky to have them on board. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Well, that leads us on to what are some things you would recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? So um, traditionally in architectural firms, uh, our job would be to, de- uh, to deliver a vision that wasn't our own. Um, and working within that structure is really creatively and professionally unempowering and makes you feel pretty unfulfilled. So we try to make sure all of our staff feel empowered and respected as individuals. Yep. Um, we give them lots of autonomy in our company to act as the design experts they are. We also want our staff to enjoy their lives outside of work. So from the beginning, a lot of our staff have been employed on a part-time basis on their own, you know, under their own, sorry, by their own choice, not yeah. because they had to. Yep. Um, I didn't have the choice to work anything less than full-time when my son was young and as a graduate, I was doing lots of overtime work without getting paid all, all weekend. So that um, left an indelible mark for you yeah. and that's something you wanted to offer and be, you know, that flexibility. Yeah, it really, yeah, that, yeah, it did for sure. And we, um, instead of working a couple of people <laughs> really, really hard, we prefer to have more people employed um, and, yeah, it just, it just works so much better. Everyone's I think like, that's a good approach and it d- certainly does help with the culture of the business to show that you that the owners really value that and think about that, their, their team's welfare. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's so important that our staff have the flexibility of doing school pickups, teaching at uni, part-time, you know, working on their own private projects or just going rock climbing for a day, you know, instead of working full-time. Yep. Um, it, yeah, it also means we can employ more people, which contributes to a wider range of experience and ideas yeah. and skill sets within the office. Um and one interesting thing um, I think is through through this and offering flexible hours and and ensuring that we have a really respectful working environment, um, it's just really it's led naturally to a more gender balanced, inclusive workplace. Yeah. When I did the calcs for a post on Instagram for International Women's Day, I found that we had a 50-50 gender balance. Um, wow, great. Across our, whole, our team as a whole. Yeah. But not only that, we had a 50-50 um, gender balance in each location mm-hmm. and in the total number of architects and designers we employ and in our business support team. So we've, yeah, we've just, I'm really proud of that. I, I think we actually sli- have slightly more women than men right now since I did that calculation. But That's anyway, I'm really proud of that. And yeah, yeah. we've got a great team. Oh, that's fantastic. Anything else on culture you wanted to talk about for the audience? All of our owners, all of the owners are all born and, born and bred Tasmanians and I think our Tassie origins have made us really resourceful in how we approach business and design and working within a budget. People talk a lot about making sure how you should, making sure you specialise in one area of product but for our company to operate in Tasmania that really wouldn't work. Yep. So our specialisation is not just in one sector, but in creating and delivering really unique projects, um, whether it's a residence, a public building, a social housing or a new hotel. Our designs are really responsive to their context um, and to the end users of the space. How much professional development did you invest in yourself, like books and podcasts, courses, training, conferences and things like that? Yeah, so I listen to a lot of podcasts and I stay... Yeah, I stay really connected with what's going on both in our own backyard and around the world. And, yep. I, yeah, I think my main form of professional development would be podcasts. Um, I probably <laughs> spend about at least seven hours a week listening to them. That's great, yeah. yeah. And so I also, at the, just before we started Accumulus, I also started a, an, an MBA at, um, at UTAS. I think I only did three units, maybe organisational behaviour, financial reporting and analysis and something else that I can't remember the name of. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway, um, things got a bit too hectic with Cumulus, so I put it on hold. Um, yeah. I mean, it's on fairly permanent hold at the moment, but 
you not going to go back to it, do you think? Uh, maybe. Yep. I don't know. Yeah, I, I might do one day. Yep. Yeah, great. But that was really useful for starting. It's been really useful for our business um, being across, across the, um, some of those issues to start yeah. with. Yep. Um, and also as architects, we, we have to undertake a certain amount of professional development to ma- yep. maintain our registration each year. Plus I saw, you know, the, the, the real value that the extra training um, provided us from my time at GHD. So yep. our, our team does a lot of professional development yep. um, from both external training providers and also we run regular in-house training too from yep. current design ideas, leadership skills, contracts, detailing, sustainable design, etc. Yeah, we do a lot. We do invest a lot in that professional development area. I think it's really important people don't realise the value of, uh, of providing that training and support and that development of your team because they highly value that time. If they, um, You get that back, I believe you get that back. People feel more engaged and trusted and, and just valued um, if you have budget and intention to develop them as professionals. Mm, and I really I love sending um, our guys off to... Um, training sessions that are not just with other architects so that they're actually getting to hear about how people do things in different industries. It's really good and getting that network of, of um, other people to, yeah. If you've had any mentors or coaches along the way, can you tell us about the experience and the value added? Yeah. So I haven't actually had any formal mentors. Um, It's a shame because I think that pretty would have been a really good help. Mm -hmm. Um, We tried to do (laughs) probably too much stuff just, working it out ourselves. Yep. Um, but for a start, the Cumulus directors are really strong mentors to each other. Yep. We're based in different city, cities, but we talk a lot each day and we're always discussing new ideas about how we can um, improve things um, and you know, what we found from our different networks. We also have had a fantastic accountant throughout our whole this whole process. Very um, important. Yeah. yeah, Simon Walker, he's based in Launceston and he's always been really supportive and has been a great sounding board for us. Any relation to Pete? No. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. No relation. Yep. Um, yeah, he's, no, he's a great fellow. Um, I Personally, I really love meeting new people and I'm always gathering inspiration from different industries. Yeah. Um, lots of the strategies and techniques that, from their other industries can definitely be applied to our business, yep. especially with dealing with HR issues, communications, systems, etc. Yeah. Um, other other informal mentors I've had include um, Dr. Kim Backhouse, who Kim has a legal background and lectures on law and government at UTAS, and she's mm-hmm. also sat on a number of different boards for organisations. Um, I really like her strategic way of thinking about things. Yeah. Um, I've also um, other informal mentors, um, Kerry Sarton. She's a director of Groom Kennedy Lawyers and she's got a really clear, practical way of analysing business, legal and, and HR issues, which yeah, I find right. helpful. Yep. Um, yeah, James so Groom used to be our chairperson at the New Zealand Whiskey Collection for a couple of years. So, yeah, I know yeah. Anthony Allen there as well. Yeah. yeah. Great, yeah. great legal firm. Yeah, they are. And um, another person I really love talking to is, uh, is Kath Kay from Comstar Systems. She's She has really great insight into the long haul nature of running your own business, yep. female, and um, and has got some really good HR tips. So I have a lot to learn from her. But I also wanted to mention that the person I talk to most outside of Cumulus about business ideas is one of my younger brothers, John Scott. He has recently taken over the reins of the manufacturing arm of, of our old family business, Jackson's Lock Manufacturing in Launceston. Right. Yep. And he's always on the lookout for ideas on how to improve um, how he does stuff. And he does a heap more professional development than I do. Yep. But I get to benefit from all the ideas he comes across. Plus, he's just a really great support and a great sounding board for me. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah. I think anyone that's answered that question, I think you're, you're the one that has invested most in both the professional development and mentors, informal mentors. Yeah, that's great, Kylie. Do you have a board of directors or advisors? No. <laughs> right. So it's just the traditional directors. 
Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. All right, we're on to the final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? I think it is, for, uh, for me personally, it's maintaining a work-life balance, um, especially when you and your partner are both working in the same business together. Yep. How the hell have you managed that? <laughs> well, <laughs> Pete is a very patient man. and um, he's, pretty, I guess, he's, he's pretty laid back. He's very laid back, which is good because I'm not. Um, so we actually met at work. So we, our whole relationship, we, I mean, we, we didn't have an affair at work. We actually, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, but, um, but yeah, we met through work and so we've always had that in common and yeah, we, it just works. Quite yeah, well for great. Us. It can work for some people. I don't know if I could ever work with a partner, uh, a romantic partner. Um, yeah, I think I've had 23 business partners now in 20 years. So I've had my fair share of diversity in uh, those business relationships. And I don't know about putting a romantic layer on top of that, how that would <laughs> go. <laughs> it is it is, it is, is a little bit tricky, but yeah, it, it seems to work for us. Um, I think this is probably a nice aside, Troy, but um, traditionally, like if you, you know, if we had a farm together, we'd be working on the farm together, yeah. like the traditional thing. So it's not, even though people think, oh, that's really weird working with your partner all the time, it's actually... Historically, it's actually been a fairly normal sort of thing to be. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I'm lucky. Pete's a really lovely, patient fellow. He and is. Very he, wise. <laughs> he, he is, especially, uh, well, I've seen, I've seen how he's uh, worked with Greg uh, on a few projects and he's a very patient man yep. and uh, laconic as well, which I really value. Yes. A favourite business book which has helped you the most? I think I would say it's the the one I mentioned before, Mike McCallowick's Clockwork. Yep. Um, yeah, just to right. have systems in place and get a, yeah, that's that would be my recommended one. And also, as I said before, that Freakonomics pro podcast about um, the optimism bias and how to. Yeah, great. I'm going to listen. I used to listen to Freakonomics, I don't know, 10 years ago when I first moved to Tasmania. I was actually in Launceston for a year and I'd walk into the office Along the time there, it was beautiful and Freakonomics was one of the ones I listened to. Really good cast, that, that is. Yeah, yep, sure. On that, any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Yeah, so the other podcasts I love um, are Radio Lab. Mm -hmm. Have you listened to that before? No, no. So it, it focus on, focuses on um, topics of a scientific and philosophical nature. Yep. It really... Um, has really opened my mind to the world around me. It's a WNYC podcast. Yep. Another one is Without Fail. That's a Gimlet Media podcast. Mm -hmm. And they have conversations with people who have done really hard things and sort of look at what's worked and what didn't and, yep. and why. And the final one I'm really enjoying at the moment is a podcast called Cautionary Tales. And it's kind of like fairy tales for grown-ups, but um, they <laughs> tell true stories about mistakes and what we could learn from them. And yep. I just think the way they explain past events just has really stuck with me. And yeah, I really love that one. That's by Tim Harford. That's great. Is that on topics like, I'm just making pulling this one out there, but like the Bay of Pigs disaster, things like that, like group think, like topics... Um, yeah, so oh, it's just off. Yeah, it's just sort of historical disasters that have happened. I'd have to go and look up because I yeah. have mine like a sieve as to what I've listened to. But um, yeah, I could. Yeah, that's right. I'll chuck it on the list. Yeah, one tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? I think get your systems in place. Um, so as that will save you heaps of time in the long run. Yep, great. Last and my favourite question: What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? Uh, don't try and work out everything on your own. Um, find some really good mentors to help you. And I think that would, that's my number. Yeah. That's my tip I would tell myself. I, right. yeah. I didn't do that, but I, I know that it really would have helped me to yeah. got some mentors in place earlier on. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for your time today, Kylie. I think the audience will get a shitload of value out of that. A lot of great uh, insight and, and from your experiences, um, phenomenal growth that uh, you, Todd, Peter and the, and the wider founders and directors have achieved uh, and the team. So I think, yeah, congratulations. You should be you know, very proud of what you guys have done and uh, yeah, keep it up. Thanks so much, Troy. Great talking to you and really appreciate you having me on. No worries. 
That's it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. It means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey. 